It's the Word of God for the people of God from Luke chapter 11. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and for our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. Oh God, you have heard our songs and you have heard our prayers and you have listened to our hearts beat. You have listened to our breathing. So God, would you pour through us now the good gift of receiving and through me the gift of story, of preaching, and imagination. For it is in your name that we pray, amen. For the last several weeks, we have looked at the Lord's Prayer not as just something to read, but as something to receive and something to embody. And I want to announce, uh, declare, proclaim whatever verb you wish to use that this prayer ought to stir something in us. It ought to do something to us. If we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, we've got to listen. And my question this morning, as we listen to this word of forgiveness, I just want to remind us that if we listen closely, that this is a hard word. Forgiveness is a hard word, which is why I've chosen to lean into The way Jesus talked about forgiveness, which is through the gift of story. You may have called them parables, these earthly stories with heavenly meanings. But I think they're more than just parables. Because Jesus describes forgiveness in an imaginative way that's meant to invite us into a space that wrestles with our notions of forgiveness. Two stories this morning. And the one is a story of a son and a father. But as to any son and father, it's a son that demands his inheritance. So the father uh, willingly gives him his inheritance and the son Uh, leaves and he goes to another country and he squanders his wealth. And you know this story as the prodigal son because the prodigal son, the actual definition of the word prodigal is to be wastefully extravagant. And this son has taken what has been given and he's just wasted it in extravagant ways, even to the point where he spends all his money And he's at the very end of himself, and he finds himself wondering what it would be like to be accepted back into his father's care, because even his father's servant eat better than he does. So he makes a decision to come home, and the text doesn't say this. Jesus doesn't tell the story this way, but it's implied that there's a bit of anxious anticipation as the son decides to return home. How would he be received? Would his father accept him? And then Jesus gives us the image of a father, not who simply meets his son, but one who runs towards his son. The image of a running father was perplexing, was out of order, was just wastefully extravagant. Because fathers don't run. Fathers correct. Fathers rebuke. A good parent would simply say, well, son, you got what you deserved. What else did you expect? But Jesus doesn't tell the story of that kind of father And as Tim Keller says, perhaps the story is not about the prodigal son, but it's about the prodigal God who chooses to be wastefully extravagant 
and kills the fatted calf and throws a party and the son is embraced and the son is welcomed home. Forgiveness is extended. That's the story Jesus tells about a loving father. Could it be true that the God of the story of Scripture doesn't just extend His mercy, but rather runs and gives mercy to you. The Hebrews sang about this in Psalm verses one, oh, chapter 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. You see, this is where forgiveness starts. It starts with our understanding of God, a God who moves towards us, a God who runs after us and says, I forgive you. And that's all made possible through the story of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says, Your sins have been taken away through the blood of Jesus Due to God's immeasurable grace, God is wastefully extravagant. And yet, and yet, we live as if we are weighted down by our own sin. And we have these chains. And we have these weights, weights called shame, which shame says there's nothing that I can do that could possibly deserve God's forgiveness. I am a mistake. I am a terrible person. And some of us don't want forgiveness because we don't think we deserve forgiveness. But God says you are that child who can come back home, I will run to meet you right where you are. Do you want to be free? Jesus says, pray this way. Forgive us of our trespasses. Why does Jesus say to pray that way? Because God will give exactly what you pray for. Forgiveness. Some of you may not be shackled by by shame, but perhaps you're shackled by apathy. You just don't care. Well, who cares if God forgives us? Who cares if there's a God anyway? I think Jesus is looking square into your heart and he's asking you to take a risk, to take that one step towards home, towards a father who is not angry, who is not upset, who keeps no record of wrongs who says is, as far as the east is from the west, so great have I removed all of your sins. Do you want to be free? This is where Jesus begins. Jesus begins by giving us an image of forgiveness, where God takes the bolt cutters, and whatever sin is wrapped around your neck that's weighing you down, God just says, through Jesus, you can be free. Free. Isn't that good news? Father, forgive us of our trespasses, of our debts, and God does. And yet, Jesus says that if you're going to accept forgiveness, you must in turn choose to forgive others. And I love what C.S. Lewis says about forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a wonderful idea until you are the one who needs to forgive. Which is so terribly true. And I want to acknowledge that forgiveness is hard. It does not come easy. Sometimes forgiveness takes time. Forgiveness can be a process. Because there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of anger that goes with Forgiving someone. 
But forgiveness for Jesus is a part of the upside down kingdom. It doesn't make sense. Why would you forgive someone who has hurt you so deeply? Look, Peter is in your corner. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, look, if, if somebody sins against you, especially a brother or a sister, you need to go to them and point out their fault. Have a conversation. Be in relationship so that forgiveness and reconciliation can take place. And Peter says, ah, but, but Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Jesus looks at him and says, well, different versions, it's either 70 times or 70 times 7. And can I just suggest as the preacher, it doesn't matter. Jesus is using the number 7. It's the number of completion. You forgive until the relationship can be whole. But the hard part is, is I don't think Jesus wants to attach any expectations to forgiveness. Because if we've been forgiven, we ought to extend that same forgiveness to somebody else. But if that forgiveness is attached to expectations, boy, that's a recipe for resentment, don't you think? So guess what Jesus does? He tells another story. I invite you over to Matthew 18. Jesus says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife, children, all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him all of the debt. Whew, upside down kingdom. Who does that? But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, a drop in the bucket compared to what he owed. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. And then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. He went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. Wow. So, my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I don't think this is a lesson on spending eternal damnation because you're withholding forgiveness. What I do think Jesus is after is trying to reiterate that withholding forgiveness is torture. That there is no freedom... when you are chained to someone else. The way they have hurt you, the way that they have sinned against you, you cannot be truly free. And I think Jesus is offering, inviting us to do what some may think is impossible, is hard, Oh, it's so difficult. Are you willing to take the bolt cutters that Jesus has so freely given you and release yourself from the chains of being bound to someone else? You see, forgiveness isn't just about what's good for the other person. Forgiveness is about you. What forgiveness can do for you? Do you want to be free? Jesus said, pray this way. Forgive us as we have forgiven other people. 
You see, it's forgiveness that's accepted, and it's also forgiveness that's extended. They go hand in hand. And I could talk for several more minutes about this, but instead, I'd like to talk to one of you about forgiveness. I've invited my friend Sally to come and share her thoughts, her story about forgiveness. Because everyone in here lives in this tension of struggling with the weight of forgiveness, whether it be the weight of forgiving yourself or the weight of forgiving someone else. So Sally, we met earlier this week. I told you a little bit about these images. So how does this hit you in terms of your story of forgiveness? Completely true. Um, I, I live this out, and I still live this out because sometimes forgiveness is a, a lifelong process. Uh, I don't think you ever just arrive uh, in a perfect place and have it all together. But I know very well how true it is that forgiveness is for you rather than the person who has hurt you. Um, I, I grew up in a family that uh, was just like you. We were here at church every time the doors were open, as we used to say. My mom and dad were both leaders in the church. My father served as a deacon and a Sunday school teacher. My mom did too. Uh, not the deacon part, but <laughs> <laughs> in theory, perhaps. They taught me that God comes first no matter what, and that's been the greatest blessing of my life. But there were things that went on at home that we didn't talk about. You see, my father struggled with rage, mm. not just anger, but rage. Mm. Rage that made me extremely fearful of him. And so I grew up, um, I don't ever remember a time that I was not afraid of my dad. Um, there were lots of times that were good. There would be seasons of calm where we would go on family vacations and we had dinner together every night. There were times of laughter and goodness, but you never knew when the shoe was going to fall. And as a little girl, I could never figure out what it was that set him off. I tried. I tried desperately to figure out what it was that would make Daddy so angry. But I never could. I tried to be the best little girl that I could. Because as children do, they think that it's their fault. I thought it was my fault. I thought if I could just be better, if I could just be good enough, pretty enough, smart enough, that maybe that would stop. But it never did. One of my earliest memories was being in the living room, watching a, a favorite show of mine, the old show Family Affair. You remember Buffy and Jody and Mr. French and Uncle Bill. I had a Mrs. Beasley doll. I was about five or six years old. I guess I was six. I was in first grade. And I, I was watching the show, and I, all of a sudden I heard uh, what I thought was uh, laughter coming from the bedroom. And the, my mom and dad's bedroom was way around from the, the den, and so I... Uh, I got up in my little pajamas because I was already ready for bed and I ran down the hall because I wanted to be in on the fun too. It was just me and my mom and dad. I didn't have any siblings. And I remember, I remember getting to the doorway of their bedroom and seeing my father with a yardstick and he was screaming at my mother and he was waving, not just waving, but trying to hit my mother with the yardstick. And my mother was trying to grab the yardstick from him. And the minute my mother saw me, I ran to her and grabbed her around her legs. And she began saying, don't hurt this baby, don't hurt this baby. 
he continued to scream. He continued to cuss. And she picked me up and ran down the hall with me. And we sat down in the den, and she was able to get him to leave us alone. I remember her holding me there for what seemed like all night. She told me we couldn't tell anybody because nobody would understand. She told me nobody would know what to do for us. And she was sort of right because in the 60s we didn't talk about such things and we really didn't know what to do. The next morning, as terrified as I was the night before, I got up and went to school and I was a good little girl and I did my best and I made perfect grades and I didn't give anybody any trouble and no one ever, ever knew what I had witnessed. I grew up with that, having those periodic episodes, not always that violent, but always being afraid they would escalate into that kind of violence. As fearful as I was of my dad, I wanted desperately to love him. I wanted desperately to be close to him. I wanted his attention and his approval. I tried so hard to get that. But by the time I was in college, after I graduated from college and became a young adult, I, I found myself getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And I would get angry at anything, at any cause, and I would rant and rave about some cause. And I, I thought, well, I'm just passionate about things. And, and I am, but not that passionate. I was about 30 years old when I finally realized that this had gone too far. I was in my house cleaning one day, and all of a sudden the television was on, and I heard music. I heard music from that old show, Family Affair. I hadn't heard it for decades, and instantly I was just a mess, just a weeping ball in the corner of my house. I was six years old again, and I was witnessing my mother and father fighting. And I, I had sense enough, God helped me realize, Sally, honey, we need to take care of this. Because you see, I'd given up on having a father like I really wanted, like I really needed, like God intended. I said, lots of people don't have dads. I can grow up without a dad. I have a mom. I have a mom who loves me and has nurtured and cared for me all my life. So I went and got some help. I needed somebody to talk to about all the things that I had never been able to express before. I needed to get that out. And the beautiful thing is that when I was finally able to tell my mom what was going on, she told my father. My father came and went with me. My father knew. He knew that he had had problems all my growing up. You see, he was just as miserable. He just didn't know what to do. And so while it's hard for me to tell you that story, I have to tell you how bad it was in order for you to know how good God is, in order for you to know how powerful God is, because at six years old, at 16, at 26, at 36, if you had told me that I would have the relationship with my dad that I have today, I would have said, that's really nice that you think that, but you don't know my dad. Some of you do know my dad, and you've seen him and met him visiting here with me, and you know, just like I do, that he loves me. Just yesterday, I was at his home. I went home because he had a follow-up appointment. He had been in the hospital a couple of weeks ago. I went. I spent the night with him. And you know what? I would have done that whether he had ever made amends with me or not because I'm called to honor my mother and father regardless but it made it so much easier to forgive him because he did acknowledge. But whether he did or he didn't, the forgiveness was for me to not carry all of that sour bitterness and resentment, anger 
that just was eating me alive. I could tell you all day the things that uh, mark my relationship with my dad now. Uh, I call him every day. Most days we, uh, he tells me about what Andy Griffith episode he's watched or what MASH episode he's watched, and we laugh. We can talk about anything. I can express whatever I'm feeling. I can even get mad at him. That was something I never dreamed possible as a little girl. And that shows you the depth of our relationship. More importantly, it shows you the power of God to bring transformation and to bring the power to forgive in me. I love my daddy. We're not perfect. We still have our moments. But praise God for what he's done through that forgiveness. takes a lot of courage to not only accept forgiveness, but also to extend forgiveness. So we're going to take a few moments to extend an invitation. And what that usually meant at the church where I grew up is we sang a song and everybody stood and looked for the sinful person to come down the aisle and repent. Here's what it's going to mean today. If you'd like, there are cards up here. And you can articulate anonymously or by name. Whatever weight you are carrying that you need forgiveness for. Or, or and, you can extend forgiveness to someone else. My friends, uh, the bolt cutters are here. But Jesus is after whatever is keeping your heart from fully pursuing him as a disciple. This is not your prayer. This is God's prayer that he is inviting you to live. And today, it's a prayer of forgiveness. So, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. The invitation is yours. Come if you'd like to receive or to extend the forgiveness of Jesus. But now I see